سنبدا شكرا لكم سنبدا بعد لحظات جلسة النقاش التي سيديرها السيد بيير كايلز. We're starting shortly our panel discussion moderated by Per Kales. I'd like to invite the speakers on stage. Dr. Abdraziz Aswelem, Professor Barry Antonio Costa Perez, Piers, Dr. Claudio Fuentes Grenwald, and Dr. Rossi Brainard, and Mr. Filippos Papa Giorgio. to uh, this panel discussion on building a blue economy in uh, Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Philippos, I would like to start with you. Uh, the Saudi plan for further development of aquaculture is a very ambitious plan, and there seems to have been quite a lot of foundation work. What do you see as the main challenge for the sector to develop and unleash its potential for a strong blue economy? Thank you, thank, thank you, Pair. I mean, I'm going to start with opportunity because, uh, as I showed you before, we have a huge market gap and we've got a, a market potential which is, I don't think we'll find it anywhere else in the world. We have a growing population, we have a young population, changing lifestyles, changing uh, the social fabric of, of, of Saudi Arabia is, is changing over the past few years and people are moving into more healthier choices of food. And this is where we need to step in. Uh, so given that, I think that the challenge is to identify what the market needs and find ways to satisfy that. We need to segment the market, identify what type of products we need to produce, what species can support this variety of products that the various target groups within the country will need. And within the target groups, we need to involve the visitors of, of the Red Sea Project, the, the, the inhabitants of the Neom area, and all these new people that are going to, to be living in Saudi Arabia, they will need healthy food. So we need to find a way to satisfy that market with sustainably produced food. And I think this is, this is a, a challenge, but it's also an opportunity to do it properly. Thank you. Um, speaking of the species, uh, uh, Abdelaziz, uh, at Kaos, you are working on a pioneering project on domestication and production, produc uh, production of native Red Sea species, as you were presenting. In Neom, we think our foundation of developing aquaculture lies in producing high-end native species with a high consumer acceptance and demand. But what was your criteria when, uh, and selection process for the species in Kaos? Uh, what are your thoughts? or how many of these pieces will be commercially viable, and which ones do you believe will be in the market first? Well, the, we, we did uh, this actually twice, in the first project and then phase two. So uh, our approach first is that our group, our research team, first to make a big, um, I would say, desktop study of all potential species uh, for uh, aquaculture native species and to do that we have to look into what are the uh, fish species native species that are cultured elsewhere and also what are the species has been that have been done in experimental uh, phase so not only the culture but also experimental phase so we collected vast number of uh, of, uh, of literature 
concepted, then we uh, listed almost 30 plus species. Some of them, by the way, probably experimentation with them, some people, just a couple of experiments. So after that, then with those species, we did further research into their market uh, ability, suitability to the environment, suitability to industrial aquaculture. Saudi Arabia is really industrial aquaculture. This is not small farming like South, Southeast Asia, where a small farmer will put something. And then after that, we collected all this information, make it available to um, in, uh, in a questionnaire side so that we give this inf information to a number of uh, stakeholders the industry, government, etc. A vast number of them. We give them this information with with also a questionnaire into their into criteria, their um, ranking of each species against the specific this. We did this. We then uh, sifted the results, tabulated it, and then we did a workshop. This workshop involved the uh, industry and government and Saudi aquaculture. Uh, society uh, as well. We gave them the results, we showed them the results, and then them, they themselves then selected the species that they have they thought those are suitable for us. This is in regard to the selection. Go briefly into the species. They were the, um, the species that shows high potential, obviously, Subaiti. It's very high tolerant, strong species, as well as good in price in the market. Silvery in color. In Saudi Arabia, red color is, is not that, unless it is very well known, like Najil. Otherwise, uh, even red tilapia did not really uh, fit well in the market. And um, so uh, in terms of, uh, of that, this is what we, we, uh, uh, that, this is, uh, what we did. And I think the other species like Najil, mangrove red snappers, and uh, uh, as well as Pampano, those are the four species that we think that they have they are uh, of very high potential. We're working on other species that might also show potential. Thank you. Barry, uh, you will be leading an effort of increasing freshwater aquaculture in Saudi Arabia. What species do you think is better to develop in the kingdom? And how can we transfer know-how or aquaculture and bring the blue economy to small-scale farmers in rural areas? So, we have to look at the commercial development and the, the local people, the academics, the existing industries. As an, as an outsider, one of the things I've always learned is that the, the local people with the academics have done excessive studies about this. And so they know the social ecological system better than any outsider could ever know. However, what is wonderful about having outsiders is that sometimes their opinions derived from elsewhere can help support the development of the best candidates for large-scale expansion for inland aquaculture that they've seen in other places and offer some suggestions. The suggestions of the seven species for the expansion of freshwater aquaculture are already very well known in the kingdom. Um, and they are the usual uh, species that are, you, you already know about that are already here, tilapia, catfish, and even small amount of carp. Uh, and then the candidates that are, we see in the import statistics, again, already well known, pangasius, salmon, trout, uh, and even possibilities of a luxury species like Malaysian prawns, has already been research done here about them. Uh, and surprisingly, you can grow, as we know, mullet in fresh water very well. Um, those, we can, you can develop a matrix where outsiders from their experience can develop maybe their ranking. However, I always feel strongly that it's an interactive process between the outsiders and the insiders in order to uh, ground truth that assessment. Now, uh, I think it's a mixture 
not speaking academically here, of the economic technological feasibility given the baseline social ecological system in the country. Um, one last point is that uh, prepare to be surprised because who would have ever thought there would be uh, recirculating aquaculture systems in Abu Dhabi or in, in Florida and the tremendous global acceptance of farm salmon. And, and so we have to look also at some of the economic drivers in the market segments. There's a very large uh, uh, non-Saudi population. They may be segmented uh, in, in the market assessments. Um, Thank you. Claudio, yeah. as the leader of the microalgae micro project at COAST, do you think Saudi Arabia can become a microalgae producer and exporter of raw material in the form of protein and lipids for animal feed? And how can this be done? Um, thank you for the question. Yes, um, I truly believe that uh, the kingdom will, be, will become one of the larger producer of microalgae and algae as a general. Why? Because uh, uh, as I said during my presentation, um, definitely there is uh, a lot of opportunities and we have a really, really uh, good environment to produce algae. Right? We have uh, one of the biggest solar irradiation in the world, which is the key for photosynthetic organism. Uh, we got a really good seawater quality uh, we got also plenty of CO2 sources. And, and the key element is that um, we have several um, industries, like the refinery, desalination plant, that they are really using the technology that we have adopted in, in microalgae technology. So I truly believe that um, the, the way that we are going to produce in the kingdom will be uh, really low cost production. And if we compare against Europe, uh, the, the amount uh, or the cost of the energy, the cost of the land, the cost of the workforce is really, really high. So at the very end, our OPEX will be really, really low if we compare against Europe. So my suggestion would be we need to compare against the biggest producers, which is currently China. So we need to uh, uh, compete with them and try to make uh, our best in order to produce uh, high quality raw material to support not only uh, the feed for animals in the kingdom but also to export in hopefully by 2030. Yes. Thank you. Rusty, you're the commercial, oh sorry, you're the chief environmental sustainable officer with the Red Sea and Amala projects. Can you briefly tell us about the project's role in the blue economy and the management of fisheries in the area? How can the local fishermen and their families be a part of the new vision for that region? Thank, thank you, Piers. And uh, it's a pleasure to speak about the, the Red Sea and Amala projects, which, uh, for those who aren't that familiar, are a key part of Vision 2030's effort to diversify the Saudi economy. Um, as, as a, our, our particular part of that is to help establish a globally recognized uh, tourism platform. Our, our basis of tourism is regenerative tourism, which, which is really built on the foundation uh, of the environment. The, we're hoping to attract people across Saudi Arabia, across the Gulf region, and really from around the globe because of the spectacular coral reefs we have, the nesting seabirds and turtles and dugongs. So our natural environment is really the foundation of both projects' uh, business enterprise. We're an example of the blue economy because everything we do is the economy related to the islands and, and the ocean environment of, of our tourism uh, development. We're unlike most development anywhere in the world, when I say pioneering regenerative tourism, what we mean by that is because of the development itself, we're actually working to improve the environment. Since the environment is the reason we think people will come to our destination, improving the environment over time will continue to add value to the reason to come. For reason, and, and the visitors, we're, we're focusing on the luxury and ultra-luxury end of the market. Our visitors could go anywhere in the world 
we think they'll come to our destination because of our natural environment. So we're working to enhance that. So we, we're, we're working to achieve a 30% enhancement of biological diversity across a 20,000 kilometer squared special economic zone. Unimaginable for development, which typically everywhere focuses on minimizing the negative impacts of the development. We're trying to completely come up with an entirely new model to improve the environment because of the development in order to achieve this very ambitious goal and tying us back to the fisheries uh, topic to achieve this goal of this 30% enhancement of biodiversity. For the marine part of that, the most significant part of that is to establish a large, and, and this is in partnership with the Prince Mohammed bin Salman Reserve, in partnership with the National Fisheries Development Program and the National Center for Wildlife, is to establish a large no-take marine protected area along the entire coastline from the northern boundary of the reserve to the southern boundary of the Red Sea Special Economic Zone. That, we believe, will significantly increase biomass, uh, and, and particularly of the large fishes, which from a tourism perspective is what they're going to want to come see. They're, they're mostly depleted in tourism developments all over the globe. They're depleted at our site right now. We just completed 300 comprehensive assessments of our reef fish surveys over the last year, and are similar to everywhere else along the, the Red Sea coast. It's, it's fairly significantly depleted of the large fishes. By comparison, there's a remote unfished area on Sudan directly adjacent to our site that has three or four hundred percent more fish biomass than our site. So we think as we establish the MPA, we'll get the value for tourism of that. Uh, some, some other areas for enhancing biodiversity are we're planning to establish 30 or enhance 30, our coral reefs by 30 percent, our seagrass by 30 percent, habitats and our mangrove habitats by 30 percent. Again, those add both biodiversity and we believe tourism value. So by, again, going back to the blue economy, the, the, uh, the efforts that we're doing are really for our business model. We think that will be the biggest attractant to visitors from around the globe than making this place in Saudi Arabia one of the most special places to visit anywhere on the planet. Absolutely, thank you. Philopos, I will go back to you. A strong aquaculture industry requires a highly skilled and well-trained workforce, as well as a critical mass of scientists to support research for continuous improvement and advancements. From a governmental point of view, what is your plan to tackle this issue? Yes, thank you. That, that's very interesting because we, we are aware that if you want to, to achieve the, the ambitious goals that we have, we must develop local capacity. Uh, long-term local capacity and we know that this is a priority we've been working on that for quite a while uh, what, what we're doing is that at the stage that we are now we, we hold uh, workshops technical workshops on a very regular basis we involve all the stakeholders of the industry we usually invite one or two experts um, in these workshops to provide us insight of what is happening in other countries uh, it is part of our plan to, to try and include uh, aquaculture in the curriculum of, of some universities. We are networking with international organizations such as GFCM uh, and, 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 and NACA because there's a lot to be learned from, from the work that has been done in these, uh, in these regions uh, and we need to work with, with, with scientists uh, in these regions, there's been a lot of capacity building effort uh, through these organizations uh, with, with very good results. I think that all in all, it is important for the country and for the industry to, to, to try and instill what, what they say in, in, in Norway, it's the culture of aquaculture, which is not just how you do things, but why you do things, which is respect for the consumer, respect for the environment, respect for the process, respect for your co-workers, respect for the, for, for the product or, or, or that you're producing. So there's a whole uh, array of, of disciplines that fall into what we call capacity building for aquaculture and we need, we need at some point to see that happening. We're trying to work with, as I said, with international organizations, with, with local institutions, and um, I hope that we will manage to achieve that. Thank you. Abdulaziz, 
I would like to ask you the same question, but from a project uh, R&D university and private sector point of view. How would you tackle the issues of increasing uh, <coughs> workforce and a critical mass of scientists within the kingdom? Uh, good question. I've been, I spent nearly all of my professional life in, in academia and in research. So uh, basically, uh, there's two components uh, to it. And we have to speak uh, frankly to it. Is availability of uh, funds, funding research, no matter what, no matter how much you need research or uh, or whatever awareness, whatever invitations, whatever, if there is no available uh, funding for research. You will not get uh, scientists, and you will not. Uh, so this is very crucial. Very the, luckily, the past since the launching of the national aquaculture program. There's a huge amount of research funding uh, coming from government to, uh, to fisheries and aquaculture. Now, the other side of it is a graduate. And again, it's, it's kind of similar but different. With graduates, you will not get talented students enrolling in programs if there are no potential opportunities after graduation. So basically, in the past 20 years, um, somehow there were very, the industry, the sectors could not generate uh, job opportunities. So uh, students will, will go for such programs out of their passion or their whatever reason, and then after graduating, no job. And then they will tell others, don't go, it's not good. So in fact, we saw some academic departments which have been uh, closed because no students are enrolling. Luckily, again, with this uh, boom in the, um, in the activities, and in the lots of job opportunities now arising, we saw uh, a corresponding a subsequent uh, increase of, of, of uh, attention to the uh, academic programs. So currently, I would say that uh, from scientist point of view, Saudi Arabia is attracting scientists both internationally and locally. And I've just met many, in fact, after this, after my talk, I have at least two or three who came to my seat talking about their interest and so on and they are available in Saudis and as well as as uh, luckily also with this uh, activity going on we have also number of students are enrolling and we see good actually graduates and I hired actually fresh graduates for our programs and now uh, and also other programs in an environmental and uh, in our environmental studies and they we really got very talented the problem is that once you uh, train them talented, there are others like Neom and others uh, uh, who also attract them. So, but this is good. This is good also because that will attract more, uh, more new students. So, I would say currently in Saudi Arabia we are really in a good position, both uh, from scientist point of view as well as from students. Thank you, um, Barry. What will be the main challenges in developing aquaculture in the fragmented landscape of rural farming communities? And what are your suggestions to overcome these challenges? So in my experience, because I, I come from a very rural area and worked in rural aquaculture for most of my career, my experience is, is that uh, most of it is small-scale operations that can reach let's just give it a number, anywhere between sort of 10 to 50 tons. This is very low production. And what they face is a tyranny of logistics. And people don't sort of break apart the logistical challenges that they face very clearly. I can say that in rural areas, when you start thinking about processing, you're leaping too far ahead. Your first stage is first aggregators. Um, during COVID, we have seen a tremendous innovation in first aggregators. Uh, delivery services or service companies that are meeting the demands of, for consistency of supply. One of the, uh, a, a supplier, a buyer, 
they demand consistency of supply. And unless they can be assured by a, some sort of first aggregator that can go in, a, in an economically viable way between a dispersed rural economy and become a first aggregator of products. Now, not necessarily, again, a processor, a first aggregator, and then deliver those products to multiple market channels. One of the tremendous things during COVID is that has evolved in a number of countries, and it's become very, very efficient. And so looking clearly at logistics in rural communities, Saudi Arabia has a fabulous road network. Okay, so, um, and encouraging the development of, of first aggregators on the logistics. Second phase is once production reaches the few hundred ton production, then you can start looking clearly at the innovations in cutting and processing and face directly the challenges in the employment force and, and, and localizing and providing good jobs, secure jobs for them. And then rural development starts to accelerate. So that, that's my first you know, take at it, is that we, we have to think about maximizing value for the supplier. Thank you. Claudio. Uh, in Neum, we are developing different aquaculture gro growth platforms. Uh, depending on products and to make sure we meet our sustainability goals. Will you have different microalgae growth approaches uh, depending on the target products? Um, yes, yes, uh, definitely it will depend on the, uh, the product, the metabolite that we want to produce. We're going to apply one or, or a different approach, for instance. Uh, if the aim is to produce protein, so then uh, in the open system, we're going to grow the algae in, in fully repleted condition of nitrogen. So basically, we need to provide them with a lot of food, with a lot of nitrogen, so then they're going to be able to produce a lot of proteins. So that is the, the main idea. Then, uh, because also we need to provide uh, fatty acid, specific... Uh, uh, such as EPA, AA, or DHA. So then in, in, in the controlled system, in the closed system, the photobioreactor, we can control almost any parameter. So in that case, the idea would be to apply, um, for instance, nutrient depleted condition. In that case, we increase the amount of lipids inside the seawater species. So these are techniques that has been used, and we prove that uh, it is a good approach, so these are the approach that we're going to follow. Also, uh, depending of, of, of some of the strain that we're going to use, we're going to apply uh, mixotrophic conditions as well, and also heterotrophic conditions, in order not only to get um, the desirable metabolite, but also to get a higher quantity of biomass. So that is the idea, according to the requirement, if it's for shrimp or fish, then we're going to produce higher protein, higher lipids uh, for these animals. Yes. Thank you. Rusty, sustainability is at the heart of the two projects. The people who will visit and live there will most certainly appreciate sustainable sourcing of seafood. How do you plan to satisfy that demand? Uh, given my earlier response, that's an outstanding uh, question. Um, and actually part of uh, the first uh, part is where we kind of the, one of the key challenges we face in establishing the no-take marine protected area is developing alternative livelihood strategy to, to develop strategies and livelihoods for all of the displaced Saudi fishermen and, and fisher folks. So that's a key part. We're already starting to implement capacity building for maritime training operations. And in, terms, uh, in terms of seafood um, consumption at site, we, as, as part of the Red Sea Project and, and Amala projects, we are, we are working to grow one third of the food consumed at site, which is both by our visitors, by our staff, and by our neighboring communities on site within the special economic zone. For the seafood,
seafood, that we're, we're striving for 100% of that seafood being grown from sustainable aquaculture. There's been much, at this, uh, much discussion over the past couple days here on recirculating aquaculture systems. That's the, the primary approach we want to take, is recirculating aquaculture systems. Again, going back to my first answer, our, our whole foundation is environmental sustainability, so that, that approach has the least risk to the surrounding environment. So that's, that's the primary, but we're looking for partners, for investors to actually help make this happen as soon as we can. So that, that's a key part. We're also in discussions because we're trying to enhance mangroves uh, by 30% of perhaps following some of the examples of Southeast Asia of establishing mangrove-based uh, aquaculture, which has been very, very sustainable. Uh, another part that's also been discussed quite a bit here, and, and pr the, the primary driver has been for a different purpose, which has been carbon sequestration to help us achieve our, our carbon neutrality pledge, which for us, we're trying to sequester all of the carbon associated with all the incoming aircraft and everything related to the project. So that's a huge challenge. So marine microalgae in particular, we're, we're looking at that in a large scale, m many thousand hectares of marine microalgae production farms primarily to sequester carbon, and it's really figuring out what is the most cost-effective use, and there's hundreds of them, from biofuels to human food to animal food, as been discussed here, to bioplastics. What is the most cost-effective model? And again, through, through investment partner and partners, coming up with that most appropriate model to make the capturing of carbon also meet multiple other purposes. Thank you. Um, at last, I, I uh, have a question to the panel. Uh, many, many claim that current aquaculture practices are unsustainable. It uses wild-caught fish as raw material for aquafeed and has an impact on the local environment. What would you say to these critics? Anyone to Lipos? May, may I, because that, 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 that sort of debate really aggravates me. I mean, we already know there's been uh, great advancements in, in science and technology on how to culture fish much more sustainably. We usually have this FCR ratio on how much food we put in and how much food we take out from, uh, from aquaculture, which in, in, in many cases is, is above one. But what we need to think is how much fish are we using in and how much fish are we taking out. And that ratio is, is well below one at the moment. Uh, it can go even further. I mean, you, you presented that earlier to us uh, with all these novel ingredients. We have our responsibility to feed the world. And I think that only aquaculture at the moment, based on the knowledge that we have, only aquaculture can satisfy that. So we need to be scientifically uh, uh, solid on how we practice aquaculture. And I think we have the way of doing it in a way that we can prove that we are sustainable. Abdelaziz, do you have any, any, any comments I would say, on this? Yes, I would say there's lots, lots of uh, misconception and misunderstanding, actually. A lot of people think, oh, it's a, a, you're, you're feeding fish to produce fish, but a lot of actually feed the ingredients comes from processed actually. The remains of the food, the process, so a lot of it, and as uh, Philippus and everybody said, is sustainable. Uh, and in general, if you remove actually aquaculture, um, it's the most sustainable uh, animal food compared to beef, compared to poultry. It's by far the most sustainable. So I think if we put it into this uh, context, See, where uh, aquaculture uh, um, uh, sits within the production of the different uh, meat uh, products, uh, you will find that really aquaculture is the answer. And besides, if we don't do aquaculture, if we don't do aquaculture, we're going to really destroy the marine environment, the, the, the uh, fish stocks. So it's not a choice to go or not to go for aquaculture. I don't think it's a choice, honestly. It's by default we are going to go to do it. It's the, uh, it's the way as to how to do it sustainably. And the advancement in science, as Philip is saying, is really progressing very, very fast. And I really feel confident. Lots of people really having some information that's 10, 20 years ago, having this bad information about aquaculture and is still holding to this picture. And I don't think they can, we, we can still 
keep looking into, her, into the past and into history. We should look forward, we should be positive into looking to aquaculture, and that's my, my view. From a non, from a person who has no interest financially in aquaculture, by the way, I'm coming from a research academic environment, but I have to be neutral and be fair with the both sides. And by the way, I'm an environmental specialist. So I look, I also understand the other side of the story. So just, just for, for this, so I think I'm positive with, with going forward for sustainable aquaculture. I think maybe sustainability in terms of aquaculture is, you know, looking at the science, but actually also, if I can use the commercial term, uh, making money of it. And I think that is not a contradiction at all. Uh, I think this is, you know, yes. where we absolutely, we, we have to get that message out uh, to be able to, you know, silent though critics yes but what i'm saying is that i don't want some of the people and this and this and the attendees think oh this guy is working in the industry he is promoting he is making commercial i have no business interest on aquaculture myself so i'm just looking at it from a neutral it's really by far the most sustainable animal production currently available to us yeah if i may Philippos. add because we often have you know, bad press uh, against aquaculture, but truth is that it's a very new sector. It's been around for, for the last 40, 50 years maximum. There have been mistakes made in the past, maybe because of ignorance, but uh, I'm pretty certain that over the past 20 years, the advancements that we've made in knowledge and also in the technology to monitor the impact in the environment don't allow us to make any more mistakes. We develop knowledge more, we apply that knowledge. We are by far the most sustainable food producing sector. And the, the bad press that we've seen over the past 10 years has not been scientifically substantiated. And we need to keep that in mind. I think uh, if I could make a comment. The, uh, actually, my opinion is, is quite different uh, because being a, an ecologist and a member of an environmental group, as well as being an aquaculture scientist, uh, I think the uh, critics of aquaculture did a tremendous service to aquaculture, a tremendous service to the environment and to people because they focused on our shortcomings of the way that it was being developed in its infant stages and to the global scientific and producer communities credit, they listened and the fish in fish out ratio for fed animals went from three 30 years ago to now below one. So we are a net producer of protein for the world now for the fed animals and then for the non-fed species for all of the invertebrates, for all of the seaweed aquaculture. That is now coming out of the latest science adds tremendous ecosystem goods and services to enhance nature and to improve nature and fisheries. And so now you're seeing the world's largest critics of aquaculture, which were mostly the Western environmental groups, the World Wildlife Fund, the Nature Conservancy Environmental Defense Fund 30 years ago were the most tremendous critics of aquaculture. Today, they're among the world's greatest supporters, hiring more aquaculture scientists and coming out with reports on restoration aquaculture. And so we have made tremendous progress since those days. I'd, I'd certainly like to very strongly echo those comments and I think for all of us is is to keep listening to critics. Critics, we, we can learn from those. Let's not think that we're infallible and let's keep listening and trying to come up with solutions as it's been done by this community. They've, they've continually overcome those critics as, as has been well documented by each of you but let's not assume that we have all the answers yet. Let's keep, there, there's gonna be more criticisms come in. Let's listen, check the validity of their criticism and find solutions. Cause I, I'm sure we don't have all the answers and we, never, we probably never will. We can always improve and sometimes it's that criticism that leaps to the confusion or to the, to the mistakes that we make. So let's, let's learn from those criticisms. 
Yeah, I, 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 yep. yes, uh, and I truly believe that the um, aquaculture needs to improve the, their green credentials. Basically, we need to apply the new concept. We need to apply a uh, circular economy approach. We need to use industrial size stream in order to produce sustainably. Uh, we need a really good uh, communication tools as well because most of uh, the bad news coming sometimes from, from aquaculture. So we need to try to uh, let the world know that we are doing a, a good job. We are trying to produce in a sustainable way. And I think it, uh, the kingdom could be a platform to show them that it's feasible to produce in a sustainable way. Mm. Thank you so much. I uh, think we have to end the session here. I just wanted to have your last word, Philippus. Uh, being in aquaculture for 25, whereas the last six in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, how do you see, uh, 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 what's your vision for aquaculture in the kingdom? How much time do we have? <laughs> uh, now, I, I think we have a tremendous opportunity, which is not just about our moral responsibility to produce food in a sustainable manner. There is some that I think that we would all agree. We also have a moral responsibility as scientists, as, as industry stakeholders, to advance knowledge in this area. It's, it's what you just said. And we have the opportunity to adapt, further develop knowledge and know-how on how to do sustainable subtropical and tropical aquaculture in the region. We can, we can showcase that. We can showcase that we can do it the right way. And I think this is an opportunity that not many countries have at the moment. If we can achieve that, I think we would have done a great service, not just for the country, but for global aquaculture. Thank you so much, and thank you so much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.